on the 325th of August 2013. Uh, we will talk about complexity. Yes. Okay? And uh, the point of this presentation really is to not go in the details of the technicalities about how you measure complexity or, or, or things that you do once you're convinced that you want to do. I want to convince you that it makes sense to look at complexity and that it's not just uh, an adjective for complicated, that it goes beyond that. So basically, what you find when you systematically analyze complexity are insights that really do help you uh, in, in many different ways. We will contextualize in design, but chances are, and my purpose is, that you will find uh, these things useful in your own very specific research fields. And, and we will see examples that are actually quite generic, so you can um, then draw parallels very easily. So that's, that's more or less the, the idea. And what we will do is to explore the architecture, on one hand, of design, these objects that we design, but also of the design act, designing. So, so we will bear that in mind. And to stretch a bit the brain muscles, um, we will start with a few questions to warm up, because there is no point in start talking and I have no idea what you have in your mind about what is complexity. So let's start very easily. What do you understand when you're talking about complexity? Especially if you use it in your own work, but if you use it just in natural language, that's fine too. Hmm? Well, for me, it's something which is not kind of it's, it's difficult to grasp what it's all about. So it's kind of this. It's so, if, for instance, the term means end relations in uh, in a certain situation. Okay. Any other? Could it be the opposite of uh, simple? <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. Yeah. yeah. For, for me, complex leads to complicated. So if you don't okay. manage it right. Then it gets complicated, but if you, if you if you do it right, you can kind of stay on top of it. That's one point. We, we will debate that a yeah. bit. Uh, anybody else? And I, well, I also when we talk complexity and the complex complex phenomenon, I there's some related concepts which I also think is very interesting. That is the concept of order, mm -hmm. complexity, uh, the complicated, and then chaos. Okay. So it's, and this is kind of a continuum I see it. Mm -hmm. We have order in one place, and you have uh, um, chaos on the other side, and then you have something which is complicated, but you can kind of ask, or there's somebody who knows the details of of it, and then you have the complex thing, which you don't really know to the very detail how it works, but you can kind of figure it out by setting up some experiments or investigating it somehow in a clever way but the, and then you have the chaos where you don't really there's no any kind of connection between these things. Okay. Well, there's a framework for which I've been kind of inspired from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that we, the, the thing is we need to operationalize it when we talk about it. And I will offer you one way of oper operationalize so it is possible to analyze it. Mm -hmm. So that's the important bit. And uh, can you just Name a few sources of complexity in your own research when you go about analyzing your particular uh, unit of analysis that, that you think this is complex. Mm -hmm. I say in very short terms, in many dimensions, many vari variables, many parts, many involved. Mm -hmm. it's, it's often you know, it's mutual somehow. There's, um, there's a lot of X, Y, Z involved. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It, it, like in my research that you cannot reduce the problem to a single key factor that you need to manage but you can only reduce it to 10 to 15 to 20 key factors that you all okay. need to do right in order for the, to see the result that you have and that can be but, from different domains but is there a limited amount of factors I think for, for any given case there, there are there's some some like, important ones and some yeah, yeah. yeah. but but it's it's not one or two or three it's uh, ten or twenty or thirty. Uh, uh, for me, it's much about uh, social structures and interests, mm. power okay. relations. <coughs> Good. A few words. 
Okay, I, I will go on because I have other questions and probably they, yeah, will, right. they will match up. So how do you deal with that complexity? I mean, you face it and you say, it's too complex, I will do the simple yeah. part, well, or you face it and you say, you will analyze it somehow. Well, I think, uh, well, first of all, you try to map it, I would argue, somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but in, I would also like to, to, to propose another source of complexity, and that is the researcher in itself. Yeah, the research <laughs> process. <laughs> yeah, Sp yeah. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else that... How, how do you deal with that complexity? Any any strategies that you use systematically to manage complexity? Mm -hmm. You could say you could uh, narrow down the focus area. Uh, and instead of solving or whatever you're doing, if you're solving a problem, instead of solving all elements involved, you can focus on parts of it. Mm -hmm. that and, and that's what the scientific <coughs> method has done for the most part, is you break down the problem in little pieces, and then you focus in those little pieces with the hope that they do provide insights about the behavior that you were analyzing, right? Mm. So, so that's kind of the, the traditional way. And the impact of that complexity, do you see it as we have what I'm analyzing, and then I have complexity, and complexity messes up with the whole thing, or do you see it as an integral part of what you're looking at? See an important impact. Uh, I would call bounded rationality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, it is an impact in the sense that we have a bounded rationality because there is so much complexity that we can only tackle bits and pieces, and we cannot know everything. So we we basically mm -hmm. rationalize in these boundaries. I think well, maybe we can know everything, but but uh, practice mm -hmm. demonstrates. Bounded rationality. Mm -hmm. So there's a role for the researcher to to give new insight to, to practice. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good point. Um, so what about design? Because in this seminar we will talk of both. So what is design for you? And in the context of design as a noun, the artifact that is being designed and designing as a verb. How do you see it? Because it, it seems obvious, but actually how you operationalize it is not trivial. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, are we talking design of artifacts, are we talking of physical things or whatever? Uh, the, when, when we design intentionally, let's say, whatever human thing that is being designed. And that can be software, it can be anything really. I mean, I don't see a good difference. So I will propose that basically the, the most simple way is when you create means to go from the current situation to a preferred one, and this usually you do it through some process of information transformation. Mm -hmm. So basically we, we pick up a set of things that we knew before, we transform them, and then we create something with it that we believe is better, hopefully, or that fulfills a particular function. Just a reflection, that is just the same way as I would call this defined by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a project mm -hmm. you can say is a that, sort of design act. Well, it, well, the, the project is actually it's a projection. That's that's something that you mm -hmm. envision out in the field which you want to strive for, and then you try to do it by all the means that you have. And the project is an interesting unit because the project is supposed to operationalize the design in many cases. So you sometimes. The project is about manufacturing or building something, in which case you take the output of the design process mm. and you just make it happen. Yeah, but, but also the project needs to be designed. So you need to have some sort of design of the project architecture. You want to generate certain uh, architecture, organizational architecture that mm. is good for the project. Yeah, and you can actually say that design is a projection. Mm -hmm. In, in which sense projection it, 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 it is a kind of visualization of a future perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's true. You imagine how yeah, it should be, yeah. and you act so yeah. that thing is yeah. fulfilled. Right. And, and that's kind of interesting. And, and what I will argue is that design and complexity are so integrally um, kind of joined together mm -hmm. that the only way to make sense of design, especially nowadays in engineering systems, is through 
an analysis and an understanding of what's going on with the complexity behind that generates an emergent design. That's that's what we will see. And uh, if if we see kind of the typical list of what is a complex system, we will find that on, and, and you mentioned this, it has a large number of elements that interact dynamically. So it's not that I put together some Lego Lego parts and I, I just stick them together. There is some sort of interaction that it's a bit more dynamic than just the, the staticness of Legos uh, just joined together. Mm -hmm. um, such interactions are, rich, uh, are very rich, or they can be at least, and they can involve things like information exchange in this system. I'm talking any sort of system that is complex. Uh, matter, the matter might be in physical contact or might be exchange, and uh, energy, energy in the form of heat or energy in the form of anything, any, any, any way in which you see energy emerging, like electrical energy. Um, the interactions tend to be nonlinear, and this is what makes complexity interesting. It's not about additive effects. It creates a transformation function that is very rich. And, and this means that small changes in inputs, or how these things start, create cascading interactions um, that, that can have very large effects in, and significant change in outputs. And this is true for any complex system, and we will see how it's true in design. Interactions are primarily, but not exclusively, with immediate neighbors. So this is important. The idea of modularity exists because of this. Exists because for a complex system to have a, uh, its behavior and its, the functions that we see, usually what happens is that you have um, areas, local areas, that are very highly densely connected, and others that are less so. And this generates a specialization in the system, right? So a car has different components, and each component we distinguish it as a component because it's highly connected between its own part, but it's also connected with the car, which is less so. Um, interactions can feed on, on themselves, and this generates this idea of recurrency or loops. And in design, we usually see this, this as iterations. Okay, and in projects also. We, we see this iteration. System might be open, and usually they are because they need to receive something from the outside, otherwise you face entropy. Um, and might be difficult or impossible to define these system boundaries. And we will see that system boundaries can be natural, but they are very blurry. And complex system can operate or operate under cool. far from equilibrium conditions, what, what I was saying about entropy. And so there has to be constant flow of energy. Something needs to keep alive the system. And the system, what it does is transform these inputs into something else. Its own operation requires energy, but also its output. Mm -hmm. um, and this complex system have this history, and this history determined, determines what they are now and what they can be in the future. Uh, but they, they kind of have this constantly co-evolution between what they do and what they will do. And elements in the system tend to be ignorant mm -hmm. from the global. And there is a good reason for this. If each part of the system knows everything of the system, then the complexity of each of the parts is the complexity of the system. Mm -hmm. And that will make sense. Mm -hmm. So you need to have this local behavior. What can happen, and sometimes we do find things where each part is as complex as the rest, if we have just a bucket of sand. But a bucket of sand, each grain of, su of sand has kind of the same complexity as the rest, we could argue, but they don't do much function. They don't have a very rich behavior. Um, so what we will do is to go through, first the context, what is designed, then what the hell with complexity, Networks and network analysis, which is a tool that we can use to, to talk about complexity and analyze complexity. Then the idea of designing design, and this can apply to designing a project too. It's, it's very similar uh, because we are designing processes and uh, some resources and the wrap up. So, to start very quickly with the framework, what uh, we will see is that we will operate mostly in this space. Uh, between complexity and this interdisciplinary design of engineering systems, but also the management of these engineering systems through their life cycles. And, and that's how this has a lot of interactions with project management, but not just with that. And when I look at complexity, I'm pretty sure that you will be able to draw um, 
a lot of analogies with what you do from ergonomy or ergonomics to the very large program management. Uh, so we're starting with, with the, the core of, of what we perceive as the design output. We have all these um, engineering systems and engineering artifacts systems if they are embedded in, in a larger structure where they interact or the engineering artifact if we just analyze the very technical aspect, right? Um, and they are very complex and they are becoming more and more complex and more and more connected. And this generates a lot of interest in that. And then uh, we have that these engineering systems have this increasing socio-technical complexity. It's not, it's not just about how the particular design is drawn and their structure in terms of the physical part, but it's also about what this means when it is embedded in a larger system uh, and in society. And this is an example of a nuclear reactor, and we saw um, in the, in, what is it, Fushima Daishi? No, that was the name, yeah. Um, power plant, the mistakes were actually not that much about the nuclear reactor or its architecture. It was things around it that were messed up. And they could have been easily spotted if we have heard the engineers that said, hold on, there are things here when, when it was in the 70s being designed, or 60s, I don't remember, they did spot the same things that collapsed at the end. So it was not the core nuclear energy technology, it was human stupidity for the most part. Plus an, an accident that was from the, the earthquake. Uh, and this is the New Orleans dam system that also collapsed and similar reasons, very social, uh, social technical, and, and um, well, uh, the shuttle and the And so what we have is that this complexity generates emergent and unpredicted behaviors. So if we just let complexity go and do its own business, we will find that we unavoidably bump into these emergent behaviors that will make our life pretty difficult. And uh, this, this has a history and, and, and has a rationale how we came to this point in time now. We started with the designer being the maker at the same time, right? Uh, it used to be the case, especially before the Industrial Revolution, that we had the same person designing and actually creating, especially when it was kind of complex artifacts. And not that much in the pyramids where there was a designer and there were slaves <laughs> doing it. Uh, but but in, in this very complex artifact, it used to be the designer and the maker in the same person. And this meant that design was a very individual act, uh, emergent, that we still have the emergency phenomena. And it was very iterative, but iter iterations on the same person. And you went constantly between the design object and uh, designing and with the prototypes and so on. But there were limitations because this was very hard to scale and mostly limited to very local in impact and, and therefore quite expensive as a, as a way of doing things. Um, and then we decided, okay, now we have more technology, we can do more stuff, so we divided designer and maker. And we have a structure where it's not any in longer individual, the design act is collected, uh, it's emergent, it's iterative still, but it's also distributed, it's a lot about information, a lot of the things that we started to do was plain information. We didn't iterate it so much with the design object. It became more and more complex and it became also strategic. It became a strategic act. The decisions we take today will affect dramatically uh, what happens when this thing is running around the street. But there were also limitations and challenges of this post-industrial revolution mode where designers were disconnected from this final design object. Uh, there were functional <coughs> and there was a reduced overview of the process. So all these things uh, started triggering the need to analyze what was going on. So we want to create more connections between these uh, arrays or, or groups of people, but that involves complexity and, and we need to design a system to respond to this complexity. So in that sense, we start kind of thinking about designing design. And uh, what we want to move now is in, in this idea where we have this sort of network design. We have this collaborative design uh, and designers and makers jointly work out a solution, right? And, 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 and we see this phenomena in this much extended and distributed um, networks of code development, new product development, and so on. Uh, so we find ourselves in a situation where design is very much a social process of information transformation, and we know that we can see information flows in networks and so on, 
and, and there is complexity there, but what we do there. So this is the situation. And, uh, and we have decided these different levels of analysis. And I stole this from Romania. Um, so we have inside of the mind of the designer a lot of complexity. We'll see which kind. We have in the interactions in local groups a lot of complexity through the communication. Actually, sorry, sorry, sorry. And we have larger networks of interactions that also generate complexity and affect the designer. And uh, I won't spend too much time here, but this is, is an interesting way of looking at engineering design, which is kind of the core when, when we talk about design, it, it tends to be in this group in terms of design in, in an engineering context. Um, and we can see this it was proposed at one point by Paul and Bates, but also Chris McMahon kind of made his, his uh, iteration on this. And, and thinking about engineering design in the very center of the stage, trying to be an interface between this kind of more engineering theory and applied engineering, and between social systems and artifacts. And I find that very useful because you can translate that also into other areas. So if we're thinking in this figure, um, we have a here engineering system because it's a lot of social system and very applied engineering. Um, we have here more design science. And I put those names and I made these quadrants in that way, so you might disagree. Um, here, between engineering theory and artifacts, we have technical system science, which takes the social aspect out. And then here, between artifacts that apply engineering, perhaps we have something more like production oper and operations. Okay? This is just one way of looking at it. So now we found ourselves in a situation where we understand the need to see complexity and, and act on it. Um, but what it is? And the, the question is, is complexity a kind of worms? And I will argue that it's yes and no in a way. So complexity, for the most part, I see it not as a kind of worm because a kind of worm, worms is complicated. When you see these worms there, they are all messed up inside of the can, but they don't have a particular structure that has a reason, a behavior, and a function. They just happen to be complicated, and it's, it's hard to make sense of it. But complexity is a bit more than that, and we will see why. But it is uh, a kind of worms in the sense that a lot of people define it differently. And that's why it's important to have a very clear and sharp operationalization. So I will argue that we have two key kinds of complexity that we mix up in our minds, and that's not good. We have a structural complexity, and uh, this can be the actual uh, structure of an organization, or it can be the actual structure of a building, of something that we design. And that's very clear, we see it, we can measure it relatively easily. And then we have behavioral complexity. And when we mix them up, we create problems in the understanding of this thing. So the behavioral complexity is, is very interesting, but we will see that in many cases, it's the structure that allows you to have a behavior, and that behavior might end up being complex. And, and this sounds sometimes strange, because we want to think um, that the behavior is not deterministic. We don't want to have a logical positivist view on things, because we believe they are richer and so on. But there are lots of ways in which we can start tackling these, these issues of the relationship be between a structure and behavior. We will see how. So I kind of made up a bit this thing, because I think it's a good way to approach this. And I think it's better to look at it first from a point of view of the very natural science and then see how this thing is scaled. So I could have gone to the level of subatomic uh, particles, but I didn't want to do that because it's even harder to, to make sense of it. But we do know that when we combine atoms in a particular way and we have a molecule that is stable and so on, it's a structure that determines its properties. And, and this is what creates behavior. So carbon is a beautiful uh, element because it creates uh, molecules that are the building blocks for a lot of things, for life, uh, for the most part. Too. And so it's this particular structure where how it is configured that creates the properties that we see. Then when we pick up a lot of these molecules, we can put them together. This is, in fact, a large molecule DNA. And it has even more properties and more interesting behavior. But it, has, it is the configuration that creates these behaviors of encoding information and all that. 
And then if we look at this DNA, DNA molecule and we configure it in a particular way, uh, we can start assembling even more interesting uh, structures. And then we go to a level of chromosomes and then to a level of cells. And here it becomes really complicated and we could spend many, many hours. So I will just jump very quickly from here to one of the most interesting um, cells that is the neuron. And it's very interesting because also its properties are the structural, yes? And the cell is the last point that biologists would claim is understood at this point in time. Yeah. So they, they, they claim that for some model organisms, so for one type of bacteria, they understand everything that happens in there. But everything that you'll talk about now, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah to, to a point. But, but what we do know is that when we change experimentally the structure of things, their behavior changes dramatically. Mm. So we, know, we do know now that, that. So there are certain things that, that are a bit trickier. Yeah. But, okay, so we have these two cells. They are connected in a particular way, these neurons, and, and they start creating things that are quite amazing. And we don't quite understand, but we know that our behaviors that probably are at the heart of what we are ourselves, what we consider a soul. And uh, when we put together these neurons in a particular pattern, in a particular structure, what we have is that, yes, we have an anatomy and what we see, but actually what is interesting is how this thing is arrayed and the neural, neuronal pathways that allow things to connect and to create these modular architectures that are quite, quite interesting. And uh, what is quite kind of telling is that they always, or uh, nowadays, we do consider that this structure is what leads to the function of the brain. And, and we can map it, we can do it. But now, with scale, we have a lot of brains. Uh, what happens? They do have an architecture, and they have social architectures. So if we put together a lot of brains, uh, this is just based on my LinkedIn network, uh, we start looking at patterns that are very much like the patterns of the brain, and that create behaviors that end up in creating some sort of function. So here we have, for the most part, DTU, the side of this building. Um, here is Anya, so, and uh, here the, is Carolina. The, the, size, the size of the dot corresponds to the size of the brain? No, <laughs> no it, it corresponds actually to the between the centrality in this case. So how is that? These people, for me, for my own network, because this is an ego network, how is that they are um, connecting different world spaces socially, okay? And there are people that are more in the boundaries, and more, uh, some people that are in the extremes, and you can identify just by doing this simple exercise, very shallow information, just from LinkedIn, you can see a structure, you can see 426, and you can see 424, for example, for the most part. And this is just the architecture of my social kind of structure, only through LinkedIn. So really, really shallow, but it tells a lot. And when we think about these systems, one driver of, of complexity is time scales. So it's not the same when we see one shot and when we see the whole thing. And if we can map the whole, we can really understand complexity much better. Uh, and also it's about scales. So if we see a different scales, uh, we will see different things. So we need to bear that in mind. So to this point, what we have seen is that complexity arises from this interconnectedness within and between systems, and you can argue subsystems, uh, which makes it difficult to anticipate the propagation and nature of change. So this is the problem we have. How we, we see this thing changing and, and the behavior. And um, on 79, Rosney proposed something that is kind of cool. I, I, I kind of like the, the idea. Um, Especially after the Second World War, we realized that complexity was really important and that systems were really important, but we were stuck with two ways of looking at the world, uh, scientifically, to the through the microscope, trying to fraction things and looking in very high detail uh, substructures without looking at the whole. And uh, this is an analogy, it's not literal, but this telescope, trying to see the whole, but not making quite much sense about how this connects with the more micro behavior or microstructures, okay? And, and, and this has been kind of a trend. And, and what he proposes is kind of this idea of the microscope, something that 
looks at the host but can do a zoom in when necessary and connects the different bits that the microscope is not connected. And we have reached a point in time where we, we have done enough of this. We need to start connecting the dots. And that's kind of really, really necessary. It's not like this is their way of doing things. This way can be done once we have the two. And, and this comes from, from this idea that we have a reductionist way of thinking, where we have the whole, we cut it apart in very little pieces, versus this more holistic thinking where we preserve the structural and, and the nestedness, we understand it, but we still can go in and out and look at how this modularity might be telling us things about the architecture of the whole system. Okay. And this takes us to, to the idea of boundaries. So, Usually, for the most part, the boundaries we draw are really naive. We just draw boundaries because we believe we need them, and in many cases, they are political boundaries more than real boundaries. So the problems we see in the Middle East are because they are not real boundaries. They are not organic. Mm. They were not defined by the modularity of the ethnicities or the beliefs. They were defined because somebody thought it was kind of easier to manage. And if they had had a systemic thinking about how this thing really worked and what were the real boundaries, and they were not blinded by this power and grid, they might have drawn better boundaries. But in any case, boundaries are really a strategy to understand reality because we know that there is a continuum and we have a wave and immediately raises this, this boundary draw in the, in the sand. And there's another phenomenon that is also at the heart of complexity that is path dependency. So in this very complex system with a lot of things interconnected, if we throw a rock from the uh, highest point of a mountain, the first part in which it will drop and the shape of the rock will change dramatically how it's the course and, and so on, right? So we can have very different paths by very small changes in trajectory or it's when you toss a coin in the air, it's more or less the same thing. And that's why we consider it a random act. Uh, but it's not really random, and if we understand the architecture, we might be able to predict a bit, or at least guide better, the, the trajectories. And uh, also when we think about information flows, uh, it's the same thing that we, we saw before in these attributes of com com complex systems. We have a river that creates a bed, that creates a path in the land. The water will want to go through that path because it's easier. Uh, so in that sense, it determines how it will flow. But further flows of water will continue determining and shaping uh, again this whole system. So in that sense, it's dynamic. We might have the traditional network picture that I, I show you in LinkedIn. But in fact, that's very aggregated. And uh, every time I, I add somebody and I know somebody, that might reshape the whole thing. Okay. And then we come to this idea through, through that of self-organization. So complex systems, because of the properties we mentioned, end up generating self-organization. Because these local parts don't know the whole, they cannot be managed uh, they cannot be micromanaged, if you want to put it in that way, but they are still organize in a manner that looks as if there was an orchestrator. There is no one orchestrator, it's simply that every part has a number of rules, a number of properties that guides the whole in a way that, that, that works, basically. And, and this is the case with the bird flocks, where they have these very complex patterns of movement and they don't crash, and it's unbelievable. And, and there is no big boss bird, it's just signals that they send to each other very dynamically and this change trajectories and this spreads on the system. And there is a network ar architecture to it. So we see the behavior, but behind there is some sort of network architecture. Uh, same things with the, with the fish, and same things, thing with all the ma major trafficking routes in drugs. Because through price mechanisms, they coordinate themselves and they make it very efficient. Uh, nobody needs to be the boss here. They self-organize and then the system works. Is that how it works? I mean, <laughs> in the sense of, if you model it as any market, hmm. 
Yes, because markets by default are acts of self-organization. Mm. You have one signal that is price, and the rest happens locally. Mm. And it's almost beautiful because it tends to lead to equilibrium. It might be bad for a lot of people, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, it leads, it ends up clearing the market, right? So, so it works. It's just that it might not be uh, lead to equality, and that's another topic, totally different. And uh, the interesting thing is that the mechanisms, the technical system we have created, are also starting to have the possibility of self-organization because what we are doing is we are embedding sophisticated network structures uh, and complex systems with the possibility of reacting autonomously to what is the other one is doing. So this uh, system that, that was, I think, two or three weeks in the news, uh, two or three weeks ago in the news, is very small robots like this size, but they can move and they can create shapes and you can tell them do an M or do a T or, do, or draw something with their shapes in the floor. And uh, there is no one in charge, they just know we want to create this structure and they negotiate their position autonomously and they get to that stage where they draw the thing. So it's not one central unit, but just a number of properties. It's harder to explain than that, but it's, it's quite interesting the idea that our technical systems are also gaining uh, self-organization. Hmm. And then all this self-organization leads to emergence. So in the natural world, we see emergence in the sense that we see these very complex and beautiful um, structures uh, that, that seem to have some sort of function, or at least we like them. Uh, and, and here you cannot see it quite well, but this is totally natural emergence of uh, structures through a number of, 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 of complex interactions with the environment. And for what matters to us, a lot of what we do has to do with this. We have information uh, and we want to connect it so it has some sort of function and it solves problems. So once we connect the dots, the information dots, we might end up with knowledge that might be what we do when we design, in fact. So we have a set of information inputs. The information transformation process is basically this. It utilizes previous knowledge and it also reconnects it. And then it gives you a set of information that has this embedded knowledge. And we are also seeing that design and designing has this also phenomena of emergence. So we can, we can see how um, even machines are being taught to design through a number of rules that eventually lead to an emergent design. And this somehow simulates, in part, what, what people do. You recombine stuff and, and, and you create the, the other things. And in order to look at what, what is happening here, we tend to use system models. And, and good system models basically preserve the overall structure, they resemble it, but they simplify it and they select a specific aspect. So this reconstruction might be a physical a structural map that looks at the forces in, inside of the tree, or it might be the flows of energy in the tree, or it might be something else. But you always keep it so that you can link them together at the end as in this graph that we uh, looked at before, where you had these different layers and you connected the layers uh, in these different units of analysis. So the idea is to go from components that are isolated to systems of system thinking, uh, too. And the argument is that interactions matter because these components, yes, they, they are parts of a car, but they don't make a car. It's how we put them together that creates the properties that make the car usable and have a function. And so we can also draw the architecture of these um, connections between the components and, for example, identify one component that if we cut the connection between one and the other, the whole car breaks down, versus some components that we may take it all together and the car keeps on running. Um, and of course, the same car is embedded in, in another system that is, for example, a local transportation system and then a more city level transportation system and, and that has a lot of consequences and when we talked last week for example with the example of Tesla uh, in one case Ford let's say they just design a car that works in the current system and Tesla has to somehow redraw boundaries and design 
other systems that interact with the car at the same time. And, and this is a typical view that you see of these systems with inputs that we were talking before, the internal kind of transformation structure with its sub, sub components uh, and the outputs, and there are all these feedback loops that make things difficult in the middle. Um, and then uh, if we look at this idea of systems of systems, how you can make it a bit clearer, you have a system, and the system has product processes and people, but people in the sense of organization. And then this product, if we just branch out this, but we will have branch out the other one, has subsystems, and each of these subsystems can be treated as a system, and so on. And the more complex something is, uh, the more we will find that we can go deeper and deeper in this structure. Uh, so all this looks very complicated, not complex, and my idea is that it's complex and not complicated. So what I offer is, is a way to look at this that I have tried and, and I think it works, which is we start by characterizing, by looking at the elements and just deciding on a few things that we want to uh, map because we believe they are key. And the more fundamental these things, the better. Okay? And this might have compositional and structural art, uh, aspects. So, one is how we connect, and the other thing is what uh, role we have, for example. Um, so the mix of PhD students in this room, uh, postdocs, and, and uh, assistant professors, and so on, that's kind of composition. But how we connect is mostly structural, and this combination will generate the behavior that we, we see in reality. So once we have that, we can move to understanding. We can move to look at the mechanisms and their relationship and then, hopefully, identifies how this might be affecting performance. The link is very difficult because causal connections are very tricky to establish. But we can still think around and look at this. And then once we have some, at least, evidence, we can move to change. So we can do uh, evidence-driven interventions that usually are data-driven um, and move into the, field, the domain of designing design. Okay? We will have a break in a bit. Um, so, the interesting bit is that if you really want to simplify this whole mess, um, you can think that we have a structure. The structure generates this behavior that we were looking at, and the behavior um, may have a function that we look for, and other functions too. Now, this actual behavior, because there is a loop, and the same analogy with the river, is shaping the structure too. So, this is one of the sources of. Mm dynamic complexity. Um, and this is what happens in nature for the most part. So nature selects the structures that create behavior functions that work, but just by trying. And eventually it will lead to, to the best structures, not because it was designed, but because it was tested over and over again. But what we do is mostly on this direction. We want the function. We want and, and we see that there is an expected behavior that generates this function, and then we identify the structure that might work. And I, I will show you an example so it's a bit more clear. So I think penguins are kind of a, a cool thing. I, I was watching a documentary some days ago, and, and I came up with this example. So the structure of the feathers in the pen, penguins um, is quite interesting because it traps air, but it's also dy dynamic. It allows to open. So, so uh, the penguins have been using this um, idea of, of this kind of property of this structure um, to generate this, this insulation. So they can protect themselves with this structure. So they have feathers they've been using for flying, but they do move them to create these pockets of air. It's very small, so we don't see it, but it creates this, this very, very clever insulation that is one of the best in nature. Um, and that generates kind of a happy or happier thing. As it can be. And then what we see is that we want clothes that generates good insulation. So we see we, we have clothes that might not be so good at that. And we identify, well, we know that these pockets of air kind of work. So what can we use? And this is the example of a very kind of sophisticated way of doing it, which is through aerogel, which is a gel very light that is almost pure air. And, and we create stuff with it, with a particular structure, and that fulfills this function. Okay? 
And uh, what I was talking about before, this is structure and composition, you can think about it as the difference between connecting and counting. So we have the idea that the structure is what connects things, uh, and we have the composition, which is what uh, we, we, when we are counting. And this is what we typically do. We get stuck in the composition too often, and we don't connect. And, and uh, when we connect, sometimes we make it in a way that is pretty hard to analyze anyway. So we create these maps that are complicated descriptions of relationship, and we just show them to the public in a paper and say, look at them, they are great. We can do a lot with it. No, we cannot do that much because we don't, we don't understand the properties of this relationship for the most part. What we can do is we can look at each of the paths and start analyzing them systematically and which path might be more central. Or if we cut something, what generates a disconnection in the network or which have more possibility to actually affect for example, in this case, as a stakeholder, the whole project. Um, so, so I don't want to get stuck too much into this, but it's, it's one way of looking at it. Sometimes we do move in the, in the direction of relationship, but we don't use the right tools. And uh, we are in this, in this point where we have this rise of new disciplines. And it's, it's really true. It's, it's something that is, is, is quite interesting when you look at uh, the point in time when these things start happening and how much of this is being generated. This is, is an example of the traditional fields uh, related with systems, system thinking, and complexity, and so on. And we have design thinking growing very quickly, and design thinking is a lot about system thinking. Uh, and you can see that by the obvious mm -hmm. correlation. Then we have complexity management a bit later on, because it required analytical tools and computational power that was developed a bit later on. And then we have network thinking that, I mean, perhaps not a lot of people use it, but I think is the actual implementation of system thinking. Okay. Now we'll have a short break. <laughs> okay, so as I was saying to Anya, what we saw before is kind of the motivational part where we try to make sense of first the design context and then what is complexity, why should we bother about complexity, why is this uh, important and useful. So what we will do now is say, okay, we, we understand complexity kind of makes sense, uh, it impacts our research and, and it impacts the systems we analyze, but how we operationalize, how we act on it. And uh, the typical thing that we can think of in, in the very first place is that we have network structures that can be formed and we are, have seen a lot of these organizational charts that sometimes make sense, sometimes make little sense, uh, because they might represent more or less reality. And then we can draw these more organic, if you want, uh, network maps that arguably might represent reality a bit better because they are based on these very local inputs that create the, 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 the whole. And, and they are based and modeled a bit more systematically than uh, of probably at least an organizational chart. Um, so that's one, one thing. And then the ways in which we can create these network maps, these, these architectures, is by identifying the elements, but also by identifying which interactions we will isolate, which ones we will look at any point in time. And they might be energy, information, material exchange, we saw some of this already, the friendship, co-affiliation, if we are both in the same group or in the same role or whatever, uh, we are in the same physical space that might affect our behaviors, uh, but spatial, financial, etc. So it is very important to identify which particular interaction, which particular kind of relationship we are mapping, because if we mix them up all together in the very same analysis, that, that will create a distortion and we won't be able to really extract insights. Um, and on top of that, I'm afraid it's a bit more complicated because, of course, we can also see intensities in these interactions, and this we can mix. It's fine. I mean, the network models that we have nowadays allow us to distinguish between a very strong relationship and a not so strong relationship, weak and strong ties. Um, and then we also have this dynamic, so the network changes over time, and we might look at an aggregated picture of the whole, or we might look at the snapshots, 
if we make the snapshot too tiny, we won't see anything. So if I look at the snapshot of the ESG group now, we will see only a fraction of the kind of interaction that we have. But if I look at this over a period of years, we will be so saturated that we won't be able to see a lot. So we need to kind of see these snapshots evolving in order to see what are real groups, what are real subgroups. Okay. We also have this idea that the relationships might be reciprocated or not in a system. It might be in one way, it might be in both. Um, and we also might combine, and this we need to be a bit more careful, uh, different elements. So when we draw these models, when we create them, the architecture might involve two different things. So it might be people and documents. And you might argue that that creates an architecture that is an information architecture that might be relevant. And then, if we really need and something we do to see these complex systems with more richness, we might have these layers where one layer might be friendship. So how in coming back to ESG, we might have a set of friendships, some stronger than others inside of the group, but we also have a set of collaborations that might overlap or not, uh, that are academic collaboration or, or whatever, and we might also have, I don't know, some, some of us might lend money to each other, and that's a financial um, architecture, and you know, you, you expect that there is some sort of correlation. So I tend to lend money to the, those that I know better. But it's not one-to-one, -one, and these architectures start telling us more and more about what this system is about. So this is just consideration. So when you collect data or whatever, you, you have that in mind. And one example that we did as an experiment in the management of change course is just we ask each of the students to tell who they were friends with or less acquaintances. So there was a spectrum from acquaintance to very good friend. And, and, and we draw a map and we see this modularity. And the modularity emerged because of a reason. So we make the students uh, wonder why it was that we had these subgroups. And we even made them identify where they might be. And they were able, a lot of them, to, to, to know without the names where, who were they. Because they had some idea about their local neighborhood. Um, and, and, and the reason was that we have two big programs, right? Uh, the, the guys on the more engineering side, the management engineering house, the full thing, engineering management, management engineering, uh, and the innovation, design innovation, right? And, and that created subgroups, but we also have cohorts, and that created also some layers. And then coming a bit to my own research, but also to, to the design field, uh, we have these information networks um, that provide us this rich view about how is that during the design process people connect to each other by the exchange of information related with the project. So we, we narrowed down very specifically the sort of interaction we were looking for, but we also incorporated other things. So this is a multimodal network uh, that combines the different uh, activities that people do, because that's important for the design process, uh, combines the people and combines, um, in this case, documents. So we can start tracing this complex flows of information and then wondering, does it matter? Does it create this structural behavior that later has a function? And so coming back to a bit more simple picture, uh, we have this flat network, and that's kind of all right, we can make sense easily to it. But the truth is that we also have this idea of nestedness. So we also have this idea that we start with that we have a molecule that then is part of a genome, that then is part of a chromosome, and then eventually we end up in, in ourselves and in our social networks, right? So that makes things a bit more difficult. But we cannot, in uh, in, in, in the sense of complexity management, to get stuck just in the nestedness. We need to somehow combine both. So what we happens is a bit this. We have this, this network matryoshkas uh, that makes the whole situation uh, 
a bit more difficult. And, and of course, this is a caricature, but this happens in reality, and we do it through specific software. This is an example with Cytoscape, where when it has the functionality, where you create this matriarchal. And inside each of these, these nests, you can embed a whole network. So you could put the gene inside of the cell in that cell, okay? And contain and create boundaries that we can analyze. And, and, and this is important, we will see it because as we saw before, um, reality has this layer. And we need to identify which level we will do most of our analysis, but if we have data, we should at least consider where is the real modularity, where are the boundaries, and we can start drawing boundaries by this. And this is how we should draw boundaries. This is part of a recent study on brain modularity, and, and you see how it's not like somebody coming and saying, okay, here is the, is, is the boundary that I will draw between two countries because of political reasons. This is a boundary draw because the system works in this way because it has some special areas that have high density because they do something different. Um, and, and this is important because then we can analyze the substructure, then we can analyze another one, and then we can analyze their connection. So in this way, we simplify complexity. Um, and this is perhaps a silly example, but it's just because I had the data at hand. This is my own last month moving around Copenhagen. And uh, it's a network in a way because each point creates uh, a, a particular connection with a space, so in that way it's a bimodal network of me and a space. It seems like it doesn't do... <coughs> we had a thing to on once. Well, yes, because during yeah. the summer the, the trains were not working in the same, in the same way. Um, and this is not that interesting for myself, because arguably I should know more or less what happened. But it's very interesting when you start mixing a lot of people, because you start looking at patterns and you start you are able to, uh, to, to design better systems if you draw these sort of networks of many people because nobody knows up front how it will be. It will be very difficult. And in fact, you could go a bit inside what is going on and, and look, okay, in the particular neighborhood, and this is actually the actual map for me, um, how is that you cross different streets and this is a kind of micro level. Okay. And going back again to this analogy of, of the river and the bed stream, we have a network that defines more or less where we move, because this is the history. Each path creates history, and it's more likely that we move through those paths. But they also create possibilities for new things to happen. Um, and in that sense, we can think in the network as the substrate of things, where things happen, but also as the catalyst for new things to happen. Uh, and this is interesting because this double function is a bit tricky uh, and is part of the complexity issue and this, this feedback that goes back and forth. We, we use the network structure, but we create new reality with the network structure that we have. And uh, something interesting, again, with this idea of maps is that really when we draw these network maps, and I have shown you some of them already, they are not like this, this network map that I show you with the, the workflow diagram before of the different stakeholders. They have mathematical properties that are defined in terms of closeness of the things. So if you do it properly, you should be able to see in the map things that are a bit like a geography, like a landscape. And it's a bit like a metro map. So it is a school, it's cute, it, it is meant to show you what is important, but it's not the actual map in this case of London. If you were to go through the streets of London with this, it would be terrible. Uh, but it, it does allow you to navigate certain things, like in this case, the, the metro. And it's much better than the actual map. In fact, if we were to go in the metro with the actual map of the geography of London, it will be very difficult to read. So it's the same thing with the network maps. And very key to all these things that we're talking about is this idea that when we have these maps, we can navigate better and we can start, not the full picture, but we can start giving these local areas an awareness and an overview that allows you to see the whole. And we saw how 
for example, it's, it's, it's very interesting, this, this cold overview effect. When we managed to have a picture of the Earth from the outside, we really understood our place much better. And it was a trigger of the ecological movement, a lot of people argue. So it's, it's not trivial to have an overview. It, it has deep um, effects on behaviors. And now, with this, we can move into the idea of designing design. So we, we constantly, before a project, before um, doing any complex design, we see it and we think, how should be the design process? Sometimes it's more or less reflective, but we consciously create, or sometimes a bit unconsciously, an architecture that will enable this act of design, especially when we are in the context of engineering systems, which require a fairly sophisticated design process that goes over time very long. And, and in this sense, we can think about it in terms of three domains, and three very interconnected domains. First is the product system domain, product system in, in the sense of, of these actual things that are in reality that we're designing, the design object. Um, and this has an architecture, each of these things connect with each other and affect each other in a particular way, and we can draw a network map of this. Then we have the process, and the process is, is a funny thing, and we will see why, because it doesn't really exist in reality without people doing things. But we still create a map of the process because we believe it's useful. Now, the picture that we draw sometimes is quite naive, uh, but it does affect the process. And then we have the actual organization. Okay, and these are actually three pictures of one of the cases that I have. So this is the actual um, biomass um, power plant that, that we analyzed. This is a chunk and a very specific representation of the process. Uh, that is actually the actual process and not the ambition process and, uh, and the actual people that, that we work with and in particular with Nicolas and Fleming and eventually this guy hopefully will give us some money <laughs> to, to continue the process. And uh, one thing with this, for example, interaction within product and process is that these architectures are not alone in a space. They are not floating around. They, they actually have, and, and we believe, they, they affect each other and their alignment or not, it is a source of performance issues. Um, and we can think about the actual components being connected in this matrix where things connect. Um, we won't go into detail here, I just wanted to give you an example. And then we have the actual interactions in the team and then we can say where. Where is that actually people that has functional dependencies from the system so the product system point of view are actually also sharing information. We can argue, uh, here we can find out when there is less information than what it should be or more. That there are ways of doing that. And, and coming closer to what I'm doing more uh, in particular, I, I start interconnecting things, right? So on one hand, we have engineering design, which set up the con and gives you all the knowledge that we have about design and designing, and in that particular aspect of designing, we have design process. And there is a lot of people working on this space that you can draw stuff from, right? Then there is a lot of increasing number of complex social technical system uh, uh, in many different areas where, where they, they develop a lot of theories that apply to any complex social technical system. And one of these complex social technical systems is engineering systems. And then what I decided, and I could have done in, in other ways, is that I will use network science, and in particular network analysis, to, to work in this interaction. So I, I really work in, in this space. But I contribute mostly to these communities. Okay. And one possibility to frame this discussion about uh, design and complexity, in particular in the design process, is to think, okay, I have design as this process, uh, as this complex socio-technical system that wants to transform information, what we were talking in the very beginning, right? We pick up a set of requirements that are basically information, we transform them, we recombine it, and eventually we get a detailed design. So I think we can say that that's a fair representation of a design process of pretty much any size. Um, and this is 
kind of the behavior, if you want to put it in a way. But the, this information transformation is the behavior we want to see. It's not the function, but that is the behavior. And then we have the design object that is what we want to do in this design process. And this will be you know, a system, our system function to transform information to create this. And we have the environment and the history. So what the company did before, the previous project, um, and, and the economic situation of the country and a lot of things will unavoidably affect uh, somehow this, this process. And also it will shape a bit inputs in terms of information, so previous projects will provide information to this one too. And then there is one thing that we can tackle uh, in terms of complexity and this, all this network thinking and all that, that are the system characteristics. And these system characteristics we saw before can be in the structure and compositional, the structural and compositional attributes um, of this system. And of course, we need to identify which they are, and we will try to work at the most fundamental level in order to hopefully um, do a bit this. So we have uh, these information inputs that we saw before, and uh, we want some sort of uh, Function and, and in our case, we want the design process to be an efficient and effective information transformation process so that um, the thing runs on time, on budget, and deliver the specification that we want. <clears throat> and we think that there are certain behaviors, certain expected behaviors that will provide this. So we create these maps of the planned design process. And these are workflow diagrams or, or Gantt charts or whatever. So we do this, and then based on that, we generate a structure uh, that will be the example of characteristic. We allocate people, roles, etc., to provide that behavior. What happens in reality is that this comes back and hits us in the face with the actual design process. That might be or not what we wanted. And this actual uh, design process will eventually deliver the, the detailed design that we want. Uh, but, but in this whole process, a lot of things can go wrong, and, and something that we needed is to be able to compare the expected behavior and the actual behavior. But the actual design process is tricky. Uh, it is uh, redundant, but it's very complex, but also it's based on this local information that usually we don't agree with. We have information to do it, but we didn't have, well, we have some modes, but I will argue that we don't have uh, as much as we could, and, and that's what I'm kind of working on. And uh, key characterization units uh, to, to look at these things are at different levels. One is activity. So we can think about activities and how these activities are developed by people, and this has a particular structure that might create behavior. So each activity, each of these small network graphs here is um, one activity and each activity has kind of a signature structure and, and, and this we will argue has a signature behavior and eventually function. Okay. And, and this is composed basically by people interacting, changing information, transforming information. Then we have interfaces in the process that connect to activities. So these are not dots floating in a space, they need to be connected because they have information dependencies. So uh, in this case uh, in one of our cases, they had to design a membrane layer for a filtration device, okay? And uh, this is dependent on the actual coding. The coding interacts with the substrate, and, and they need to share information. How they change information is through some sort of interface. And the interface also happens to be through people interacting in a particular way. And then we also can see at the whole process. So we can zoom out in this idea of the macroscope that I was talking about in the beginning, and we see the whole and its evolution. And, and this is one way of looking at it. And, and in my particular case, I have divided this in, we have these system characteristics of the design that have compositional and structural issues. Uh, in, in the compos compositional aspect, we have people, and they come from different departments. Um, and uh, some data is cross-sectional, so you can see it in any point of time how is that this composition exists, but you will also see how this thing fluctuates in time. How 
the different departments are more or less present over time. And then structural, these densities of connections, for example, how they are at any given point in time and compared across activities and how they evolve over time. And then we can think about the whole process of, as we saw before, the activities or the interface. And then we can put all together in an integral analysis. And so the idea is we move from characterization per each of these units of analysis to analysis and interpretation. Because this is what we want to provide. We want to provide real insights that we can act on and, and create some sort of support. So for that to happen, we need meaningful viability in dependent variables. So the activities, the interface, or the process, we need to compare it against something. Um, and we need a, a dependent variable or benchmark. So the so what question. Does this create a problem? What, what is the actual behavior that for us is a function that, that we're looking for? And I will argue that at the level of the whole process, we have variability that is very easy to see over time. So we can compare the process evolving over time, the different stages, and, and the benchmark will be what is the expected system evolution. And we have some ideas about the expected system evolution. Then, in terms of interfaces, the variability might be because we have so many interfaces in the project and they have different architectures. And I will zoom in here later on. I will not go through each of, of the kind of areas of the study that I'm doing, but, but I will zoom in here so you, so you will see it. And then we have activities, many activities. They can ben benchmark against each other, but also against what we expected up front. And the dependent variable might be. So this is just to give you an idea how is the process. And I think it's very consistent with this idea of system thinking in the sense that we start with a very specific problem and we try to abstract this at the system level. How is that this thing was um, the, the overall structures that generated this thing, that generated this problem. So, so I abstracted the whole issue to a higher level. I explore, I generate models. And then once I have from the problem a model, I decompose this thing into pieces, in bits and pieces, which is, in this case, the activities, the interfaces, and inside of the activities, well, what is an activity is people who think, so on. And then I run this detailed analysis, which takes me from the model, I need to put together some sort of method to, to run the empirical analysis. And then I integrate back together in order to have this holistic interpretation and, and reach conclusions. And, and this mixes qualitative and quantitative stuff. So when people say, Oh, well, this needs to be very quantitative. Not really, because to understand the system, we can only understand it first through this exploration, what is going on. So we draw organic boundaries, and we also identify the key things that we want to analyze, because complexity is complex. So we, we need to, to select um, things that will lead us to something meaningful. And, and we have different sources of information. So what I tackle on, I try to use as much information that is there already as possible. So this includes from email to project documentation, showing you formal and structures, especially internal company systems, that, you know, log things as they happen, and, and, and questionnaires. And this some, somehow takes me to a network representation. And there are many network representations, not just one. And then we have this idea of, OK, if we zoom out of it, we have network design, and we could see it in, in very small-ish organizations that do high-tech design still, but they have certain patterns. We can see it in larger organizations uh, that have much more issues in terms of the distribute, uh, how distributed is design, uh, especially between also uh, and across organizations, and at the industry level. And, and we have run analysis in each of them, and we have found that the same logic to go about them works, at least a bit, I will argue, and, and, and it, it helps us to understand a bit better what is going on. But what we will focus is here, and in particular in the interface in the example that, that I will give you now. So just to make it a bit more concrete, and, and so you can imagine what to do when you are doing your own research and, and my trigger ideas. So I just say, OK. We have a way in which two activities exchange information, and this has a particular structure and composition. And I argue that is people the one that 
exchange information. And there might be systems too, and in the future, more and more intelligent systems will act as interface, but we're not quite there yet, so we can move in, in this mode for, for the most part. And one way of looking at this is we have this organizational architecture, people connected with people inside the organization. We need to be very careful in defining them, and that's why I was saying, for example, information-driven interaction for one particular project. Uh, then we have the process architecture, this kind of naive model of how things are connected sometimes. And then how this edge in reality exists. And I say, well, this edge exists because in each side uh, there are people working and some of them interact with each other. And they have a particular composition. So here we have an example, one person from I don't know, R and D, two people from production, and two people from design. And this plus the roles they take in each activity, some might be leading one activity, some might be just supporting, so this generates a slightly different interaction pattern. And, and that's still uh, composition in the sense of how many are leading, how many are, are, are not. And then we have the interactions between them, the exchange of information. And all this will lead to, for example, more silo or less uh, silo thinking, and might lead to more or less information flow ultimately. So we see an interface that is quite critical if activity F and G really needed uh, to exchange information and, and, and do a lot of com complex work from the design point of view, you will want a very healthy architecture at this point. If, if this looks broken, chances are the design object will break. Um, and, and one way of doing this is you collect information in terms first of um, which, which are the activities that depend from each other. So this is a micro example because we have two activities that we're looking at uh, and one depends from the other in a particular way. Then we have the organization matrix, all these people connected in, in, in a particular way through, through this matrix representation. And then we have the affiliation matrix. So each person is affiliated with a particular activity. Um, so in this example, we have a, a person four that is connected with activity one and activity two. So you see it there. Okay, that's, I, I won't go in depth here, but it's just to show you the, the rationale. And then we might say, okay, how following the same kind of uh, overall methodology that we saw before, we have we structure all our data inputs, we have a list of design activities, with that we build a process architecture, we also have an organizational architecture, we have the mapping of people and activities, and we have this information about departmental affiliations. All this information is arguably easy to collect. I mean, it's very specific questions that you can ask. So it's not complex in, in that sense. This information bits more or less readily available that make complexity because they are interconnected. Um, then we start the process interface characterization, what we want to describe and, and analyze. So we combine this process and organization architecture, and this tell us the size of each interface, how many people are involved, but also how densely they are connected. This super basic network um, attributes or network metrics, but they are important and you will argue they are fundamental. And then we also calculate the heterogeneity of each interface. So there is a measure, a measure to see how diverse is anything. Um, and there are many measures for that. And I selected this because it was more practical. That is the uh, index of qualitative variation. And then I take these three things and I perform a cluster analysis to see which interfaces are alike. And I will show you a very concrete example to make that a bit more clear. And then I test if these clusters, if these interfaces that are similar, are indeed also associated with particular performance. Okay? If they are, then I have something interesting. If they are not, at least I have prov proven that these things are, do, do not seem to affect much. There is no obvious relationship. So then I move to this process uh, interface interpretation and support. If the clusters do differ in terms of performance, I can start creating cluster level interventions. I change things in those clusters that look like they are going wrong, 
and I know more or less which characteristics seem to be related with that, and I can start tinkering in that direction. And if not, I might have tried to anticipate too, because theoretically we know that certain characteristics are better than others to produce efficiency or effectiveness, and I can anticipate problems. And when I was talking about clusters, I was talking about this. So usually, because of the effect of modularity, but also because of how things work, you have subsets of things that are aligned. And if you only think about the independent variable being the one that is dri driving the clustering, you might have the size, the density, and this diversity, right? And when you run the analysis, you might have three clusters, you might have five clusters, you might have a number of them. In this case, it happened to be three. And, and I have one cluster of interfaces that have a lot of people in them that are not so dense and that are mediously diverse in terms of departments. And on the other extreme, I have some clusters that are very, not, do not have too much people in general. They are very densely connected and they are not very diverse. And this might be related because the different um, activities that you do have different characteristics have different needs, but it might also be related with certain ways of doing things. And, and this one in the middle is kind of also in the middle. It has a lot of diversity, but density is eh, more or less in the middle, and, and, uh, and size too. Okay. And we did find that interface problems seem to be mainly in this one. So for this company, this particular case, when they had pretty big interfaces with low density and medium diversity, so diversity you could argue is it's, it's normal, these ones are the drivers, you tend to have way more problems. And way more like, way more, because they, this concentrated 53.3% of all the interface problems identified, and it concentrated, uh, and from the total of interfaces in the cluster, 61% had issues. Uh, so it is kind of significant, it looks significant. Um, and the other ones, arguably not that much. So what we could say is, when we have pretty large interfaces with low density, we might provide more support we might create more instances for connections, and we might perhaps break, break down these interfaces in a smaller chunk. So they are not just one massive interface. They, they are more manageable. Okay. Um, sorry, yeah? Okay. Can you just go through that just once more? So the number of interfaces is the size. Yeah. So large means a lot of interfaces, um, as in... No, this is, yeah, this okay. is, I mean, size yeah. is only the, um, yeah, so in the total population of interfaces, how many were in this cluster? So in cluster number one, mm -hmm. from all the interfaces we had, uh, we ended up with 13 interfaces. We here ended up with 38 interfaces and with 28 interfaces. And then this size is the amount of people inside of the interface. It's, okay, it's so, so the two size is not the same size. Not at all. Ah, okay. Yeah, not at all. So let's say cluster one. Yeah. Um, so the, the the first graph, like size graph, or oh, second, sorry. Uh -huh. So that shows that. What what the mm. x and y axis on the. So this is a distribution. Yeah. And it says that okay, most. Good. So this is the amount of people. And then it's saying that the, at the level of this distribution is skewed towards lows. Most yeah. most of the interfaces in this have lots are, of have loads of people. Yeah. And, and this density-wise, from the total population of interfaces in relative terms, it concentrates the the lower density, so the less connections between the members. Ah yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's and yeah. Sometimes you just skip things and it can be quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this a lot of people, lo low connection, mm -hmm. and a lot of diversity seems to affect. What? I mean, two it's thirds not a lot of the of diversity. It's kind of medium diversity in this medium case. Medium diversity. Okay. I mean, it, we might broke yeah. down. So I yeah. might just pick up this one yeah. and rerun the clustering only here, and perhaps it is a hypothesis. The ones, the sixty-one percent of interfaces with problems, perhaps tend to be the ones. With more diversity than mm -hmm. that you, you could yeah you could argue that but it doesn't seem to be the case. Okay. What did you show in the middle? Oh 
Oh, so IQB is this one, and uh, is uh, yeah, yeah, the inversely. Yeah. So the, this is how the, the density. What do you? What do you? Could you explain that one? Yeah. More? So um, uh, yes, here. So if everybody is connected with everybody in the interface, all of them exchange directly information, then the graph will be fully dense, and this has a value of one. It's how it's measured because it's just a proportion. Really. If only, you know, from here we have five. If um, two out of five of the, is two fifth of all the top of potential connections are actually there, then you have a uh, two divided by five density. That's how it works. So it's actually fairly easy to interpret as a measure, and that's kind of a nice thing. Um, all these measures here that I have selected are extremely easy to interpret. Um, Density, in particular, science even more, and IQB actually quite easy to interpret because also it runs from, I think, so from one to what? Yeah. So if you go back to the what? Yeah. What? Uh, no, no, the one you. you uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the first column, the middle one, density. So most have low, most of them are lowly. Uh, this this or, or how do you, how do you? How yeah. Do you so just just so. This is one cluster, two class, cluster number one, cluster number two, cluster number three, right? How do you explain this one? So this means that cluster one has, from the population of interfaces, very low density because most of the, of the interfaces are on the population side of, of think, lower density. I said scarcely connected. Yes, scarcely connected. Oh, okay. most, most are scarcely connected. Or, um, yeah, in this cluster, yeah. They, they, they are just not very connected. Okay. Yeah. Most, most of them are not very much connected. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, exactly. it, okay. You know, uh, okay. the reasons for that so, might be many, but we need to take this as something useful for the particular company. I mean, in other companies, this might not be an issue. It just happened that here it seems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something very basic? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think this is very interesting. I'm, I'm sorry I was I just missed 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. My father called. Um, um, uh, uh, some very basic things, um, because what you're studying is uh, exchange of information, right? That's your that's uh, the basic. In this particular case, the connections between people, and only the connections between yeah, people yeah, okay. are in for, uh, but okay, interactions okay. based on information. Okay, but but very, I mean, just the, the basic legal mm -hmm. parts you're actually studying is. As I understand it, you are studying what you have a lot of persons. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have person A and a person B, mm -hmm. and this person A sends a mail to person B, or what? Yeah, I mean they, they report. It depends where we get the information. In one case, yes. we get it through a questionnaire, and we ask them with a degree of intensity, um, who do you interact with, and how intense? What is the impact of that interaction, and so on? Okay. So okay. so they report back. Uh, in that case, from this very uh, bottom-up perspective, uh, mm -hmm. what are the interactions? And you, for the most part, you do remember who do you interact with in the context of a project. So for instance, you have 10 persons and you ask each of the 10 persons, how much do you connect with the other nine? Or uh, Yeah, so I have the list of people. They can mm -hmm. also add new mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and I give them, uh, do you interact? And if you do, to what intensity and what's the impact? Uh, okay. And but also that, the that, that's, that's basically how you get your data. Yeah, but, but, but do you aggregate uh, different kind of uh, uh, data than using maybe email communication yeah, as well? Yeah, so, so I have done analysis to... in different ways. Okay. And uh, what I have <laughs> seen so far is that actually the questionnaire, mm -hmm. which is arguably quite basic, um, gives you similar information to the email communication. It's just that the dynamics you cannot get. Because if I ask you, who do you interact with in the context of this particular project, you will be able to tell me, but you cannot tell me in this day I interacted this much, or you know I interacted at all. But when you say much, I mean if if my perception of interacted with ten people the last year, mm -hmm. I could say oh this person I, from one to five, four, this person from one to five, two, and so on. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. But if you study the male correspondence, my male correspondence with these ten people, mm -hmm. you might find something else. Yeah, I'm yeah. just wondering, how do you measure much and 
less. Yeah. How, how do you measure that? Because I, I could just, for instance, I could, I think we discussed this before. I mean, maybe I have an uh, interaction or a discussion or exchange of something with a person because we have some problem we have to solve. Mm -hmm. But I don't regard them as a important uh, or a person I, I interact with a lot. And another person, maybe we don't have any problems in our collaboration. And I don't interact a lot, mm -hmm. at least not with emails or. So, so how, how do you measure? No, that's, that's a good point. I think that to really clean sort of the data, mm -hmm. it's important to run the questionnaire because in the questionnaire I do ask you what is the impact of that communication. So I ask you what is the intensity okay. of the interaction, is it, it, is it uh, daily, uh, weekly or monthly, but I also ask you what was the impact in your actual activity. So I could uh, clear up that. What I have found is that for the most part, when you aggregate so kind of detailed data, in either way, questionnaire or, or email, these local biases on the whole are kind of even out to a, to a point. So it, it's quite a resilient structure, the network. Um, you might have local issues in terms of a measure, but as long as you have the whole, that issue, I mean, there has been studies that are actually really good that they, they introduce fake data uh, or they remove randomly data from these big networks. Mm -hmm. And you can do up to 20% and get pretty much the same network structure, as long as it's random. Because if you target the critical component of the network, you might destroy it at once. <laughs> but, but if it is random perturbations, it tends to even out because of how these things work. But how do you, how do you, I'm just wondering, how do you actually um, deal with the problem that if you say you have these 10 persons and A says I'm communicating a lot with B and B says I'm not communicating a lot with A, mm -hmm. how, how do you actually cope with that? Um, ah, yeah, so you, you see that, that's a good point. You, you do uh, a few things. One, if it is systematic, I mean if, if you find this thing spread across the network, then you will have to, to look for a uh, qualitative explanation and, and, and somehow redo the thing or something. Mm -hmm. If it is very sparsely this effect, you symmetrize. So you take the average. Okay. Because, I mean, something people fair forget enough. that fair they enough. interact with somebody. It's fair enough. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. It's bad when you ask a friend, like you do a friendship network. <laughs> one doesn't report. <laughs> but that's why I symmetrize in the case of the course, because I didn't want to show yeah. them. <laughs> when this, this effect was happening. But anyway, I, I, I will move is a bit she, faster. Is she a good friend or not? You can ask her. Yeah, no, I, I did ask that, but then I yes. symmetrized with the maximum value because otherwise it's kind of politically incorrect. But um, the, yeah. the discussion is actually what I understood is about what is the reason behind the connections, right? The exchange of information. Because as she said before, there could be different layers, mm -hmm. like in the group, we can have a layer of, of friendship and then interaction of sharing connection and then connections where we lend money, mm -hmm. as she said. But the interactions of sharing information, they could actually be influenced by the connections of the friendship, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and this is the cross uh, effect. So what you do is you create a structure with a very clear uh, set of information that is not ambiguous, if you want. And then you try to see in the structure reasons for that structure. So in the case of the pattern of change course, we saw that part of this architecture was driven by some, some other architecture that came from other domain, which was their affiliation to a particular program. And it's true. If I had a macro map with everything, I will eventually end up with a model that does not require that interpretation because it will show it to me. But because I don't have all the information, I get the structure and then I interpret the structure. And uh, there is a qualitative judgment. Mm. Yeah. Could, could you, um, just, just an idea, could you say if you had an organization with 10 persons and you asked each of them, um, who are your friends from a scale to one? I, mean, I know it's, it's not, not a nice thing no, to no, do, yeah. but uh, among these nine other persons, who are, how friendly or how much a friend are you with these uh -huh. persons from a scale from one to five, for instance? Could you 
actually use that network you create to some to do you think say something about the the, the culture in mm -hmm. the organization or the the, the um, you say that the on the um, uh, the unofficial network in, yeah um, you have you have an official organization structure but you also we also talk about culture in this mm -hmm. could you could you somehow use that yeah I mean to, what you to, what you do is you compare formal and informal social structure so the formal mm -hmm. social structure could be you know all the groups inside of the company as defined by management <laughs> and their hierarchies. Who reports to who. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one official picture. And then you get all the friendship. And then you might compare. And in a company that is very organic, very flat, you know, you will probably end up with a situation where they two resemble each other because in a flat structure, the the subgroups and the things that happen will be driven a bit more organically. But if it is a highly hierarchical structure, the chances of a misalignment between that and the organic part is high. And you might argue that culture doesn't foster certain things like information exchange or innovation at the, at the end of the line. Um, so wrapping up some things, what, what I think we have hopefully learned is that visualizations kind of are a interesting things, not only because they are nice, colorful pictures, but also because they give you information that <coughs> is very difficult to get locally, and, and that takes you to a position where you might be able to make better decisions. And you also empower people to make their own decisions. They don't need to be told something because they might need to know how to, they might get ideas about how to navigate themselves. Then all this idea of interaction and communication being quite um, important and driving other things that, that determine, in this case, how the design is done. And uh, perhaps mixing these two, we have the, the, this reflective design activity and, and the empowerment of, of design. So what we're trying to do with this research is in part using this to a point. It is most obviously of use for a project manager or something for somebody that is managing the whole thing, but ultimately it should be usable by everybody in their own local context and, and in the macro structure. Something that is actually quite cool is that we... Uh, I don't know how much time we have. Um, no, we still have some time, so I, I, will, I will show it to you. Uh, we just kind of finished uh, a very usable prototype of a tool that we were creating with Anya and... Um, uh, Julia, that actually allows you to run your own your own analysis without a particular software that is too complicated. So this looks complicated, but we actually have an app that you can use, and it's extremely simple. I, I will argue. So once you have an architecture here, we have an example of people connected with people. Okay. Through what? So uh, sorry. In this example, the connection is what? So Remember, this is affiliation my, of the group. To this the group. is. My example with Liquitech, so how people uh, interacted exchanging information, it's just one example. So it's a very simple organization network, but the informal one you want to say, or the actual. Um, and in this uh, tool, you, well, this is the demo, but you can uh, go and upload your own data in CSV in very simple form, so we made it extremely easy. And then what you see is a report on your network data, that you can see it as an edge list. So CSV is connected with CTH with intensity three. And so that's readable in that sense. Or you can say CSV is connected with CTH with connection three in the matrix. And there are different reasons why you use one or the other. What is nice is that we can calculate a number of measures here. So we have the node, the degree, how many people it's connected with, the betweenness, which measures this idea of centrality and how you have power to influence between groups, uh, and other measures of, of power uh, is based also in centrality, how close these people are, uh, and other measures of centrality, and, and one that I like particular, which is information centrality. So you can do that very easily. Obviously, you need to understand what the measure is, but the process is simple. And then you can even see a matrix that is colored, and that with information centrality, 
you can actually see, okay, and I'll even change the color. Um, no, red in the high. I don't know. Doesn't matter really. Um, so you can basically see patches of people with higher connections. So you might end up identifying what this this you need to cluster properly, but at the eye you can see okay, this is a patch of highly connected people. Okay? And so on. I, I cannot explain in detail this, but you also have the more traditional uh, network graph, um, and if uh, you can decide uh, even the layout, so if for your particular purpose it's easier to see in, in, in different layouts, you, you can do it. Um, and each layout has a different interpretation, but it's exactly the same data. Um, so it's kind of quite cool way of looking at the systems that we were talking about and, and start doing your own analysis and can and we will see, uh, clusters can you identify yeah clusters? i mean here in this in this particular view i mean let me you could just in your put, grid right but yeah but oh, actually eh, this data set is small it's very small the demo uh, you can put a, a much bigger one so it might not be the best for um, identifying clusters but i okay. guess you might see here i I think with this data, it's not great it's not, for not identifying data, classes. Okay. It's, it's 10 people. It's okay. really, really small. Yeah. Um, but that's one thing that is kind of a surprise. And another thing that, uh, well, I mean, I don't know how much of what we were talking about made any sense for your own research, but I hope it does, because uh, complexity certainly has a lot of, of implications in, in a number of areas. and. We saw that we have behavioral complex complexity and structural complexity. You might operate your research more on the behavioral complexity side, and behavioral not because it's one individual, but because it's the output or the outcome of a particular structure. You might not be able to identify the actual structure. So, uh, yeah. Peter, I, 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 uh, I, I lost 10 minutes of your very good, uh, I'm sorry about that, but, but uh, and I, I don't think I have a clear mm -hmm. connection between complexity and network. Um, but I, I can certainly see you know, the network now. Now, for the first time, I maybe understand what what you mean, mean by <laughs> network, and I, I can. I mean, it can be applied to so many areas, mm -hmm. um, and I and I, I understand that you actually re relatively easily can get the data you need. Oh, well, to, well, well, okay, <laughs> but you uh, at least you're <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to. Oh, the data is simple. Yeah, like but, 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 but we could. We could for some. Purposes we could relatively easy get the data we need. I, I know I'm sure you have working with much more complex data. I'm sure about that. But and and I could probably use. I don't know if I have the time for it or if it's I will. But I could imagine that I could use even your fine app. I mean it's it's fantastic. But but um, I was just wondering, could you just give me one more chance to understand what's how do you connect complexity with your network parts? So, so I say what, see. What, what, Network analysis is one of the ways in which we can uh, get an idea of the, proper, the, the properties of the complexity and what we can we manage, right? So network analysis is one, and you have other, like system dynamics is, I would argue, very much a network-driven approach, but this is slightly different. The so you, so different. what you say, if you have a system, a very complex system, and you, for instance, want to see how is communication in this complex system, Mm -hmm. Then you can use network analysis. The thing is, yeah, mm -hmm. it, okay. just to make yeah. it yeah. The, the most easier part. So we we started with the what makes something complex. Mm -hmm. and we said in very short terms that is a lot about having a lot of elements and dynamic interactions between the elements, right? Yeah. So okay. if you have a lot of elements and interactions, something becomes complex and generates behaviors that go beyond what you can predict usually, uh, at least when you think linearly. And uh, because complexity is about elements and interactions, that works quite suitable for that. But it's not the only one. It's not the only approach. And, and I will argue... It's not the only approach. Is there other Because there, there is, yeah, what I was saying, like system dynamics is slightly different. Then you have uh, machine learning. So a lot of people approach this, not necessarily in a traditional network sense, but they analyze these big data sources and they identify patterns, okay? And pattern identification in big data do analyze a complex system, but 
it starts from a different point of view. It's, it's almost the composition of what's going on. It's almost the behavior. So they look a lot at behavioral complexity. And behavioral complexity can be reduced to a structure, but there isn't a step there. It's, it's not quite immediate. Pedro, how, how do you see the, uh, I mean, what you have told us, it's great and very interesting. It is. But it's very, very empirical driven, data driven. How, how do you see the connection between this kind of work and more theoretical based work on social technical systems? I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of theories of, of how dynamics are in social technical systems. Um, how can you relate these two <laughs> areas? Yeah, I guess that the key connection point is that we use the theories mm -hmm. to first generate hypotheses. So we have these ideas that it's not even complexity studies, but in management we have these ideas that diversity is good and we say collaboration and I map the collaboration work yeah. in the last UMB and it's all over the place. But we never actually think about what it means. What is the structure and the architecture of collaboration, right? So we have theoretical ideas about higher collaboration leads to, uh, it creates a space for diversity and that might lead to innovation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But we do little with it, with that info, mm -hmm. systematically. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just thinking of this uh, part that you're writing on uh, the shared learning points and reflective design activity and empowerment of design because to me that's more the normative perspective you could say of your research. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on, not necessarily how is this used, but more what are the normative implications? I think that's really interesting. Also you say this could be used for instance, by a project manager. Um, well, initially, I would think how to interpret say, these data and also the network analysis that you are doing um, for a project manager in, in order to handle these types of information, how to actually engage with, I don't know, somehow managing these informations on if you want to improve the way that people are interacting or sort of interfere with the network analysis or the way that the network is actually um, behaving. Mm. I, th I think that this is quite important, this idea, that the moving between the scripted and prescriptive and normative, right? And uh, the thing is, when you have these complex social technical systems, they are very different animals in themselves. I think I, I, I'm convinced about this. When you go about bringing up this kind of very generic advice to organizations, it's tricky because it's like thinking in each organization as a very homogeneous, similar animal. And, and each organization is a very different species of animal that has adapted to a particular environment that has particular function. And in order to do that, they have a very particular structure. So if we prescribe that everything needs to be very densely connected and super high collaboration to everyone, that might not work the same. So what I'd say is we go in a deep descriptive analysis that is systematic and is scalable for each organization that we look at, mm -hmm. and then we look at patterns that relate that the structural complexity with their own behaviors that might be associated with performance. And then we start this reflective movement that might allow you to improve the situation. But if you jump, or the other thing will be somebody saying, you know, just run a hundred of these studies, get the generality, and tell us what to do. And I think that might work for very rough lines, but the two things that will happen is one, all the particular cases will work, like the very extremes in the industries and all that. But in 10 years' time, industry has changed so much that things are totally, totally old. And it's when you read management advice that is from the 80s, it's like sometimes you cannot make a lot of sense of it because mm. it was a, a different situation and, and different in those industries. So that's kind of my take on it. But I mean, when you use the tool like this, mm -hmm. some information is provided. What, what should be done about it? In, because do they want that, to act? That, that information is my independent variables. Mm -hmm. So that information is the structure or 
relates to the structure of my particular situation. Then I can pick up another set of information that is dependent variables more performance driven or something that the company wants to find out. And then I relate this structure with their particular performance. And then I can draw lines between them. And, and then I can tell them, yes, you should, or you should try at least, to rewire your organization because in this interface or this set of interfaces, things are not connected quite well. The reason might be silo thinking or silo thinking, or you know, it might be that two groups were merged out of nowhere, they didn't know each other, they hate each other. If they work connected. Mm -hmm. But then you do localized interventions. So 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 the, the network analysis is a good basis for a discussion in other do you, have you tried that? Have you made a network analysis in an organization afterwards, presented it yeah, for the persons and, and as a basis for a discussion? Yeah, yeah. and we yeah. have a funny story. So, <laughs> the thing is, I ran this analysis in my second case. I mean, my first case I did it, and I don't have a funny story. It just worked, and they felt it made sense. Mm -hmm. okay? With the second case, I ran the analysis, and I stupidly shift a column. <laughs> so all the connections were messed up. Not all, but a lot. It was too much. And uh, I printed out these humongous posters. And, and uh, everybody went to there and it was like, they were a bit puzzled. <laughs> and I, I was trying to tell them, yes, you need to look your stuff. They are, you're there. It's like, obviously, it just must be that the other one didn't report you or something. Or, you know, the symmetrization wasn't wrong. I was kind of frustrated. And then I look at the data and I was like, Oh my god, this <laughs> is wrong, all the maths are wrong. And then I read it, and then I show them back to so not everybody, but, but quite a few. And then suddenly they make sense of it. And I think this is the key thing. You can make sense of it once you have the whole. You just think it's right. It makes sense. But you cannot draw it. If I tell you now, all a whole draw the whole thing, you won't be able to make sad parts of it. But not to the resolution. I think that's quite telling. And uh, to finish, I think it's good to think in our society with, with this idea of awareness. Uh, I, I really believe that to understand these things, you need to look in your own networks. I mean, I was talking about this idea that when they saw it was not right, they didn't make sense, but when they, they, they could see themselves, they could make sense. Okay. And so if we think in terms of DTU, for example, I will argue that what we do is a very open-ended, ill-defined design process. We are creating knowledge, we are doing information transformation, and each paper is a design output, but they are part of a bigger design process. And we somehow want to make, um, you know, uh, provide these outputs to somebody else that will hopefully use them in reality, right? So, but it's, it's a lot like a design process. It doesn't have so much difference, it's just that it's more open-ended, it's more diffuse over time, and we don't see how it's used as a lot of issues. Um, and how we see ourselves for the most part, and how management sees us, is like this. Okay, we have a structure that in part is defined by where we are and all that, and, and there is people, some have a lot of publications like here, more than 340 or something, I don't know how he does that. And uh, then we have subject areas like engineering, others, so this is just count. And we can count a lot of things, and we can count a lot of stars. Um, There's no management? Yeah. Well, if you look at all the DTU, it's highly engineering. And a lot of what we do is categorizing mm -hmm. scopus as engineering when, when it comes out. And in fact, this has overlap. Because things are tagged as engineering and as uh, environmental science something. And there is double time. But, but the point is, this is counting, and it... The question is how much it tells us about what we are. And I will argue not a lot, because if we compare it to MIT, it doesn't look that different. Um, we have a different structure, but for the most part, buildings scattered around, whatever. I mean, this, the, the different departments might be scattered in a not so different way. We have people with a thousand publications that's a bit different, I guess, but um, all in all. And then uh, the, the fields change a bit, but they are still diverse and whatever. I mean, is it really a difference? 
that is so big and that's my home university, uh, you know, the, we have more medicine, it's, it's an inter very, I mean, it doesn't have a focus, it's not an engineering university, so, so you have a more diverse pool of things, but all in all, it doesn't change that much. And it doesn't provide us information that tells us a lot about the behavior. But when we map BTU, and this is 20,000 papers of the, of the latest, in the latest part, I think BTU has 30,000 or something, so I, I, I cap the analysis at 20,000. This is how it looks like, and it's very much two groups. We have one group that is environmental, bi microbiology, environmental science, a lot of bio, bio things. Um, and then we have another group that is very physics. So it's physics, photonics, stuff that is kind of hardware, you know. Um, it's kind of management. That's it, show up that map. How I did this map? Uh, it's one way of going about it, and because if we have information, is when somebody publishes in a journal, that's a sign that they participate in a research community. When somebody publishes in two different journals, it's a sign that these two journals are connected at least by one person. If you collect all the information of all people publishing in all journals, it will give you a landscape of knowledge based on the probabilities that you two communities are connected because they share people, roughly speaking. Uh, and this is the map of the BU. Um, it is a bit broken in the middle, but it's interesting because in the physics space, for example, you have a lot of things going on, like you have photonics very closely together with more um, natural science fundamental physics. And, and they do a lot of exchange of knowledge apparently. And this might explain why it's so good, I and mean, they do pretty good stuff. Uh, and then same thing, we're very strong in microbiology, and they happen to share in this kind of space a lot. So there is interdisciplinary in the biosphere and the physics sphere, which they are in themselves pretty big community. But how does it look at MIT? So in the other categorization, look at pretty similar, but here it looks incredibly different. It's like an explosion of galaxies that makes actually quite difficult to identify communities because Everything is so connected. Like, they have a way in which they operate that produces, I will argue, more value through these connections. And they have, obviously, scale and all that. And they have history doing this. But the point is, here, bio is intertwined more with, with other things that they provide inputs uh, for others to work with. And, and this is also 20,000 papers. It's not like I'm putting different amount. It's the same amount. Uh, so you see much more diversity and more interconnectedness. And then in my home university, because it's, it's very different, like the, the whole thing, it has so many disciplines, and the Latin America thinking about how to do these things is very politically driven, so each chunk is compartmentalized. They are good in what they do, but they don't talk too much with others, but I have, in fact, very interesting stories how theology, because we're a Catholic university, connects uh, the law space with the medicine space it, uh, and the ethics space. It's quite, quite interesting. But anyway. And then we can obviously zoom in and say well, management papers, how they look like inside. This is not DTU management, it's all the things categorized as more social science uh, management in the scope. So it has some different things, and we can see operations being very important. And, and this tells you about how this design mechanism works, so they, they, they design what they do in a way that uses, for example, draws more from mathematics and computer and simulation and so on, uh, and they are the ones that connect it. They grab it from, otherwise it will have gone into space, but they do grab it. Uh, it will have gone in, in the map that doesn't contain this, it contains the whole university, it might have been disconnected. Um, and then you have building an environment that does connect in an interesting way uh, operations and uh, um, the more managerial innovations. It's interesting actually that ergonomics appeared twice as quite a let's see here uh, as a quite important interface for for a lot of knowledge in this mm -hmm. space. And and then all this is our space more or less. I mean, and and actually if you look up because there there are names if you zoom in and and 
we are some, I mean, I'm not in Scopus, but uh, Anya is here, and, and the ones that are in Scopus are there. Um, so, so that, that so information from is Scop is information from Scopus? Yeah. 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 It's based and then on you, journals, right? It's the journals. Yeah. Yeah. So, name of the journals. Oops. Um, here you can see in the zoom in a bit more in, in our space how you have R&D management, research policy, Journal of Technology Transfer, International Journal of Technology Management, and so on. And their sizes are based by how much brokerage they do between and how, how central they are in the structure and the importance of the, this journal in the connection between two different areas. Okay? And then, interesting how cleaner production starts connecting with more hardcore stuff down there that are more technically driven, but it requires the, the managerial perspective, the system thinking perspective. I think you can tell a lot about that. Um, and then we can also think about engineering systems. The word engineering system, how is that people use it? And this is just by keyword. So all, um, well, 1,800 papers that contain the word engineering systems in the title, abstract, or keywords. Um, how is that these keywords look like when people think in engineering systems? And we use a part of this space, not all of it. And coming back to ESG level, so our group, <laughs> uh, you can see here based on keywords. So when we share keywords, um, we are effectively signaling a connection. And uh, you can see, uh, and key, here is ESG plus co-authors. Mm. Okay, so here is, is Anya and all the co-authors in any of the papers, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and same thing here. And they will be more or less connected in, in the case of two things, really. I mean, one, if they share a keyword, and the other one, if they share, share co-authors, because if they share co-authors, at one point they have a paper with the same keywords. Okay, so it will be part of the whole thing. And you can see how, for example, there are different, I won't go in detail, and you can make your own interpretations, but it does tell you a bit, from the keyword point of view, what, what is going on. And then you might say, okay, but um, when we look from the point of view of, um, I don't know, wait a second, ah, yeah. so this is people connected because of keywords, and these are keywords connected because of people. Same information, exactly same information, but it tells you a different story because here you look at how keywords, for example, innovation, joining up two subsets, if we have time to sum in, you will understand what these clusters are about, product development, connecting, uh, very importantly, a lot of subspaces, and, and change management, design management, construction industry strategy also being quite important. And then we could also see how is that our references make a difference. And I will argue that more in the microspace. So what I have been doing here, I have taken you from the stratosphere to inside of your brain. Because inside of your brain is when you design <laughs> the particular word. So the keyword you select is because in your brain you thought it makes sense. So, so here is at one point in your brain you thought this reference makes sense. And you started creating an architecture of references, and this is the architecture of references in our group, uh, with certain key things that have been cited over and over in all the papers from all of us that are in Scopus. Okay? And then even micro error, <laughs> because this is one person, and this is Anya's publications connected by their keywords. So inside your own publications, mm -hmm. um, you have some sort of structure. You have change paths, and you have explored different areas, and, and this somehow tries to see, based on how each paper share keywords, how these keywords have some sort of architecture that tell us, um, from a particular person, how does it look its own research based on keywords. And then, you can also make the analysis by references. So one person and their own references. And this architecture will also tell you what you consider our distinct communities and you know how, how you arrange this. And even more into it, so this is the microspace. You could, and this is what I did on my spare time. Oh my god. Uh, is, I took my thesis. Yeah, so I put all the thesis on plain text. And then whenever two words were close to each other, uh -huh. I created a connection between those words. So 
Um, basically, you can understand the text without reading the text. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but <laughs> what you can do is to compare different pieces mm -hmm. and see, okay, they have an architecture in terms of how they think things are connected and what are their subject matters. And if you compare a thousand pieces, you will have an architecture and you might be able to cluster these pieces based on what they were talking about. And this a computer can do. You don't need somebody to read it. Um, the Design Society has now 200 theses online mm -hmm. available for everyone who's a member mm -hmm. and especially targeted as young researchers as an example. So, not now you write your thesis, but at some point in your spare time you may want to yeah. play with that. And then I've, I've, I selected a few, and there are many others, but I think just trying to put the finger in each of the topics we discussed today. Uh, we have some things about this, this is Alex Pendler from MIT, working more on the social space and the social physics, this, this complex social system. Then we have Dubek in, in the systems that are for engineering systems, and, and he doesn't really go into the detail here in this book in the actual network analysis, but he talks a lot about complexity and, and what it means. Then we have the actual network analysis with, with uh, Stephen Eppinger, um, that, that goes in the very detail about how you measure, how you quantify, and, and how you test hypotheses and all that. And then uh, one example of, of design process uh, um, uh, or engineering design literature, if you want, that, that draws in, in a lot of the things that we also talk about, I mean, that, that connects with a lot is, is that. So I think this kind of shows you where I am in the space and, and where this design and complexity might be found. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pedro. You, you should uh, lecture us one day on how we make simple networks, basic networks. Oh, it can be done. Yeah, it could be, uh, yeah, workshop. Yeah, it could be very, very interesting. Oh, when we when we have the the tool ready, yeah, we should yeah, kind of really yeah. socialize. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah maybe yeah. even optimizing network uh, capital. Which kind of keyword you could actually use if you want a simple decision in the mm -hmm. research network? Because it actually seems like it matters. Oh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. spend some nice playing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Could also be an example to PSM demo on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, very many fascinating things. Um, <laughs> the, I suppose. Yeah, taking the tool for the community as well for the group, and yeah. maybe even in the stream fund as an option. Mm -hmm. or something. Nah, um, to scale it and all that. Yeah. Also, I think the the questions when how can we use this practically? How can designers and project managers? So what you could do is maybe also write an overview of the interface problems that you found, like all the thirty or seventy something, mm -hmm. and then have the maps, and then say, okay, so for each of us maybe three bullet points as guidelines, as, as really concrete, specific actions. Very down to earth. And I'm sure those can, can then be used also by other people's research. I shall have a booklet that is the very highlights in simple terms. Yeah. yeah. I, f I feel this could be really a topic that's connecting also as a, as a, as a group level. Oh yes, indeed. Like a, yes. A, a method we all can yeah. use in our research. Or leverage. I mean, how I see it is that I get to a point where I don't have the background and the, the knowledge to interpret. Right? I mean, you get the architecture, you kind of see things happening, but you don't necessarily have the theoretical layer to interpret it because, from an ergonomic perspective, it will be different mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. from uh, another group like risk or uncertainty or, you know. The, the things that you bring to the table are very different. So once you have the analysis output, mm. which, for example, I can do very easily, mm. more or less, I have learned to do it, um, then for me, the complicated part is what is easier for you. Yeah. What is easier for you is what is complicated for me. I wrote down a, a couple of quotes. No, um, you go. Um, what I thought was also quite interesting is, very philosophical, but I think this applies to us very directly. So 
that what creates history, but at the same point, the catalyst for change. And I think that's that's for us in our research group quite important as well, because we, we have patterns how it has been before, and that influences what we do now. But at the same time, if we see that, we can then intervene. Mm-hmm. And then so, that also, and then the other, the um, when we take a step outside, <coughs> so the overview, we understand where we are. So in some ways, you, you would maybe say we need to dive in deeper, more detail, but no, it's actually also mm-hmm. step, really step out. Mm-hmm. So that, that's quite, quite, quite telling. Step out in order to be able to focus yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. um, I had a, you mentioned the word non linear. Mm-hmm. The little I understand of this is for me that, that you know, a line would be if there's a, if the double amount of interference or interface or communication, then the line would be, the thickness of the line would be double. If, so there's, this, it's linear. What you sh- show ah, us, right? Okay, I see so, what you So, so how can you how can you embed the nonlinear yeah. elements? Yeah, the thing is, at the very micro level, things become linear. So, um, when you look at a dyadic relationship between you and me, and, and what a uh, dyadic mean? relationship is just two people, right? It is or two mm-hmm. parts, and and I can see that being quite linear. Mm. I punch you in the face, you punch me back. <laughs> and probably how hard I do it, it depends will, on how hard you push. Yeah, yes. right? <laughs> and, and that's kind of linear. But mm-hmm. if I do something to you and you have a number of connections, they might come back against me and I cannot predict quite well what will happen. Right? I mean, if I only think in these two connections, that's somehow linear. But if I think about the cascading effect, because you also have your own connections, so if we are very good friends, they will end up meeting your friends. At one point, but the, the path and, and how this thing works is not linear. Um, and uh, in particular, how things flow in the network and the behaviors become nonlinear because of this. Because one small thing can trigger large effects, and in that sense, it's kind of nonlinear. It's not additive in, in the same way that we think about other things. So you could make one network analysis at one time, and then you could trigger something. Mm-hmm. And then you can make a similar analysis afterwards, and you will see that maybe a very big change. Yeah. So or that, that, or could, or that could be a way of kind of including non-linear effects. Or yeah. whatever. But also the network algorithms already, you know, when they create the layout, they, they are non-linear, not, not in the in the traditional way, because they, they take the whole and all the all the connections in order to create the layout. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? I'm amazed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so sorry I couldn't be here earlier. I'm sure it was excellent. Um, so this, for now, in the regular schedules, this concludes the seminar.